Good morning, everybody. I hope you're well. <sighs> Chilly one out there today. Yay, 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 as my Italian family likes to say. So we're in Luke chapter 9. Um, we, uh, you know, I, I was <laughs> going back. Did I skip over chapter 7 and 8? Anybody notice that? I can't remember. I may have to go back because there's some things that I think are incredibly pertinent. Well, not that any of uh, the scriptures are not pertinent, but particularly pertinent. Um, hope you had a wonderful weekend. Uh, if you're attending Mosaic, we started our series through Jonah yesterday. I think people are really excited about that. Some of you, of course, followed through Jonah in October, November, and end of December. Um, but I think, uh, for whatever reason, the Lord laid that on my heart and it's been a good study. It's been a good study. So what are we doing here in Luke? We've been looking at, um, Jesus having sent the, the, uh, the 12 out uh, with authority and power. And they went from village to village, um, preaching the kingdom, healing the sick, and we talked a little bit about, so if we go back to chapter 9, and we'll go to, or excuse me, to go to um, verse uh, 1. Well, we'll start at verse 1, and then we'll we'll make ourselves to the next part, right? So, Father, I pray that you would just guide us in your word. Jesus, let us see you. Let us hear your voice. Uh, make us more like you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So... It says, when Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Take nothing with you, he said. I need you to go and trust the provision that your father will provide you. This is an important element. We talked about this a while back. The whole idea that we need to, uh, as we go forward and God sends us, you know, we look at Matthew 28 and we look at the Great Commission. What does Jesus say? He said, all authority has been given to me. So what does he say? I've given you authority. Now, this is temporary. Uh, we've covered this a little bit. So if you go to, if you were to read Mark 9, for instance, and you look at Jesus driving out the demon in the uh, the young boy that the father brings, and the, the disciples have this, They've, they've had a discussion with um, the Pharisees, uh, and they couldn't drive this demon out. And they asked, why not? And I wonder if part of it wasn't that they had had success before. That Jesus, had, at this point, had given them the authority to drive out demons. And all of a sudden, they run into one they can't. And Part of it is this trusting God, is trusting the Father. It's recognizing from where the power comes. Historically, Jews, Pharisees, teachers of the law, they were you know leaders in the community, were driving out demons. And they had special incantations and prayers that they did. But according to Jesus, there was nothing left after a demon had been driven out. So he says that that demon, once driven out, will go into arid places and finding no place to settle, go back to the original, find that it was empty and swept clean, and it would bring seven demons in stronger than itself. And the man would be worse off the second time than the first. There was a lack of power in the work that had been done prior to this time. And I think what we're seeing here, where Jesus says, listen, don't take anything for the journey. I've given you authority. I've given you the power to do these things. This was for this moment in terms of ministry training. And it was something that he was doing to get them to, to trust the Father, to trust the provision, to walk by faith, to recognize that the power is not in anything they do or even anything they say, but in the Spirit itself. The authority of the name of Jesus the spirit that they would be indwelled by, to the glory of the Father. This was not for them to do. This was them for them to cooperate with the Holy Spirit as to be vessels of noble purposes. So again, we go to the Great Commission. What does he tell us? He goes that word authority again. He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, you go make disciples. I'm giving you that authority. And then he says, now what I need you to do in the meantime is I need you to go wait for me so that I can give you the gift that my Father has for you. That he had actually told the disciples about way back in John 13 or 14, or 14 or 15, the Holy Spirit. And so all this authority that Jesus would bestow upon the, upon the apostles to then um, to disseminate to those who would follow them, 
all hinged on them receiving Jesus' authority and then the Holy Spirit's power. And then and only then do we actually function in kingdom strength and, then, and are able to do the kingdom work. And so that's why you see it appears to be a little bit of a contradiction from story to story, but you realize that there's, there's a method to Jesus' madness here. There's an order with which he's doing things. And what he's trying to do is cultivate in the hearts of his disciples a trust in him, a trust in the message, a trust in the power, a trust in the authority, and to not trust themselves. This is a lesson we all, a lesson we all need to learn. If we, are, if we have a relationship with God and Christ, we have the Holy Spirit, we have that power, and we have that authority. Now it's up to us to cooperate, to seek holiness and live holy lives, to seek peace, that established peace we have with God. He wants us to seek that to, as to realize it and bring it forward with us. He wants us to be praying in the Holy Spirit, that we would be dependent upon him, interdependent with one another, going out to make these disciples. And so this is the twelve's first training in this regard. So he goes on, he says, I take nothing on the journey, he says, and he, he, he speaks to what they're, they're to do. So he went out, it says in verse 6. Is that 6? My trifocals aren't working real well this morning. So they set out and went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing the people everywhere. And so we see the disciples doing exactly what Jesus had called them to do and finding success in having done it. So much success, in fact, we go to verse 7, it says, Now Herod, the Tetrarch, heard about these things. And we talked about this a few days back, a few sessions back. And the idea that, uh, you know, Jesus on one hand says, when you do your acts of righteousness, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Do it in secret. Matthew, he says, they will see your good works and they will glorify your father. So there's this balance to be had. It is not that, it, it, so when we do our good works, we're to do it so humbly and so quietly, so matter-of-factly, that we would be much like the sheep in Matthew 25. When did we see you naked and clothe you? Well, when you did it for the least of these, you did it for me. He always sees. Jesus always sees, and he always rewards. Well done, good and faithful servant. Everything that I have is yours. Come and join, join me in my happiness, he says. So what is the dichotomy here? A matter of the heart, a matter of attitude, a matter of dignifying the one we serve, a matter of desiring to glorify God. That as we go about our business just quietly, matter-of-factly, in cooperation with the Holy Spirit, Wanting, to, wanting just to bring honor to Jesus and, the, and life to the one to whom we minister. We need not worry about announcing it to anyone. God will see it, and God will make it known, as God wants it to be known. And those are the good works that are seen in Matthew that cause God to be glorified. So this, again, is not a contradiction. It's a matter of the heart, the intention, the motive, what it is we're trying to achieve, how it is we go about it. And whether or not God would, would, when and if and when God would decide to declare this from the mountaintop on our behalf to his glory. So Herod finds out about this. And he's blown away. And the question we ask ourselves is, are we working and walking and speaking and loving and healing in such a way as to have it trickle to the top that others would hear? Not because we've announced it but because they cannot help but notice. So we go further. Then when the disciples returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with him, and they withdrew themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. And he welcomed them, and he spoke to them. And we just went, this, it went through this in our last session together. That Jesus, though busy, having responsibility and trying to achieve and accomplish something here, trying to train his disciples and give them rest and restoration while continuing to debrief about their ministry experiences, to develop camaraderie and develop fellowship and belonging with one another. The crowds come, and Jesus doesn't seem to be annoyed here. He doesn't seem to be bothered. He looks up, he sees the crowds, and he receives them. He welcomes them, and he speaks to them. This is beautiful. And this is what another thing that we have looked at that we need to learn. Are we in a position, in a state of heart and mind? Um, are we stewarding our time and our effort and our resources in such a way as to be interruptible? 
accessible, approachable? Do our eyes say yes? And when that happens, do we welcome and speak? Now we go on. Look what it goes on to say now. He says, when the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with them, to withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. He spoke to them about what it is that was waiting for them, if they would receive it. What it is the Father would have them know about himself. How Jesus would reveal the Father to the hearts of those who are seeking and he healed those who needed healing. He touched the lives. Now, it could be a physical, we talked about this too, it could be physical healing, it could be emotional healing, it could be psychological healing, it could be spiritual healing, it could be relational healing. God does heal, and the Word of God heals, and the kingdom of heaven moves forward with the power to heal. It's not up to me how that healing occurs, why that healing occurs, when that healing occurs, and what we perceive that healing to be what we thought it might be and what it isn't. But there's always healing. So let us not be fooled into thinking that there's only one kind of healing. No, there are many healings, and the Word of God always heals. Whether it's the healing of the perception, how we view God, our attitudes, our hearts, our heart's condition, our minds, our confusion, our anxiety, our depression, our not knowing. Revealing sin to us that, have, that is created dis-ease and disease in us, revealing that to us that we might repent and therefore live a life that begins a healthy journey in Christ and in life. Every aspect of our person is touched and potentially healed by the Word of God, the Spirit of God, the message of God, and the Kingdom of Heaven. Addictions can be broken, and all the dis-ease that comes with addiction can be dissipated and healed. Sometimes it's instantaneous, but most of the time it's a process because what God is trying to do is glorify himself in us and then guide us to righteousness, and that takes time. It takes effort, but here's the big thing. It takes cooperation. It takes our cooperation. He does the work, but he asks us to join him in the work. Second Peter puts it this way. He's given me everything I need by his glory and goodness through his power, but now I'm to make every effort to cooperate with that power that's in me to add to my faith, right? So there's this beautiful cooperation that God calls us into that we should relish in, and it brings healing to self and to others. So we go on. Late in the afternoon, the 12 came to him and said, send the crowd away so that they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find some food and lodging because we are in a very remote place here. And Jesus said, you give them something to eat. You feed them. You take care of their needs. Now, re remember, earlier, he'd give them authority, authority and power to do what? To preach the kingdom of heaven and to heal. Hmm. Now, and all of that by trusting God and his provision and resting in that authority and learning to recognize the power of God and our reliance on the power of God. Now he's going to expand this out. Look what it says now. They answered, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish. Unless we go and buy food for all this crowd, about 5,000 men were there, which also means there were probably ten to 12,000 other family members. This could be up to 20,000 people. But he said to the disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. Have them sit down in little churches, little fellowships, little gatherings, little enclaves where they can commune and speak to one another, where we can organize them and take care of them, where I will teach you how to shepherd each one, almost like a pastor would shepherd a church. That Jesus being responsible for the 20,000 sends each one of us to the smaller groups or the individuals with a responsibility, something to do. And he says, again, trust me, trust my father, trust his provision, trust his power, trust his name. Be grateful and serve. What does he say? 
He goes on, he said, um, he said, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. Verse 15, the disciples did so. And everybody sat down, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, acknowledging his father, recognizing his father's power, authority, position, and provision. Jesus, being in line with the Father, now in cooperation with the Father, gives thanks. Mm. Grateful for the little tiny bit he has. Resting in the authority of his Father and the name he was given and the power that he was granted by the Holy Spirit as he left his glory, Philippians 2, and did not use his power for his own advantage, mm -hmm. No, he rested on his father. So not only was he doing this as coming as a man and now resting in his father with cooperation and cooperation with him, both God and man, now with God through the spirit. He's also demonstrating something to his disciples that we are now to pick up on. Being adopted into the family of God, now children of God, co-heirs with Christ, with the power of the Holy Spirit, with the tiny little bit, the tiny little morsels and provisions that were given. If we would turn and acknowledge our father, we would give thanks for even the smallest little thing that we have. In fact, we need to even rejoice in our suffering, recognizing that in the midst of our suffering, God does profound things, rejoicing in the Lord and what he will do. Jesus himself gave thanks, and he broke the bread, and he began to dispense of it. Now, here's the deal. Very, I, you know, I, could God do this again? Absolutely he could. But there's something more profound here we need to recognize. What is it that the disciples were sent to do? Take a message. Of whom? The bread of life. Who is who? Jesus. One person in one place. Hmm. But Jesus would allow his body to be broken, to be fed to the world, to give life. But he said himself, it's, I know you're sad because I said I have to go. But if I don't go, I can't send the Spirit. So it's better for you that I go. In other words, the one loaf broken, put in the hands of the Father, grateful, for the provision of the body, Hebrews, now broken, presented to the Father, the Holy Spirit is now distributed among the many, much like we see here. So as Jesus is demonstrating to the disciples all these things with regard to the kingdom of heaven and the power of God and his great provision and his, his miraculous power and his willingness to heal, to feed, to sustain, to keep. He's also demonstrating what's to come in regard to the church. There's one body in Christ Jesus, but many bodies to take care of the masses. Break them up into fifties, sit them around. You serve them, taking the little bit that we have is a representation of Jesus' body himself, who came as one to be with us. But once broken, in gratefulness to the Father, he is taken up and the Holy Spirit is sent, and he is broken up and then given again to each person. And we will all eat to our full. And in fact, there's so much left that there's that we can gather it up and give more away. Being sustained by it, giving it away, and being sustained. So look what it says now. It says, they answered... Excuse me, he says, the disciples did so. And everybody sat down, taking the five loaves uh, and the two fish. And looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and he broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to, to set before the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 baskets full of broken pieces that were left over. The God's provision is never lacking. And in fact, it's always abundant especially when we talk about the Holy Spirit and the power of the Spirit and the provision that he gives the church to connect us, unite us, and make us one. That Jesus, the body, the loaf of bread that was broken up and with thanks and, dis and distributed among the many. So it is we see here. And so there's this beautiful model Jesus is setting up. He is actually showing the disciples this is what it's going to become. They can't imagine what's actually happening here because what's actually happening in the moment is he's teaching them to trust him, to trust his father. He's teaching them to look to the father for all things, to be grateful for what it is he provides and to trust his ability to provide not only for them, but through them to others. And in particular, 
not just bread, but the bread of life. What did Jesus say to the enemy when he said, turn this rock into bread? I know you're hungry. Jesus said, ah, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word spoken from the mouth of God, the kingdom of heaven, the message of hope, the person of Jesus. And that's the authority that he's given us. And it's the message that he's given us. And although it seems as though we have this tiny little provision, looking up to heaven, relying on our Father, resting in him, trusting him for his great provision and power, broken, distributed to the many. And we have the joy of being the servants to bring it. The universal church, broken up into tiny churches, pastors and shepherds who care for the flock, a great shepherd who broke himself for the sake of the body and distributes, him, distributes himself by the Spirit to all, to every, to each one who would come. And then we have plenty left over to give away. That same message, given authority and power now by the Holy Spirit, we go forward making disciples and teaching them how to love Jesus. That's the message here. May we live that out today in grateful appreciation for our position in Christ, our gratefulness for the provision that he gives us, offering it up to him in even as meager as it is with thanks, being broken, and then the privilege of distributing both the brothers and sisters in Christ for care and encouragement, admonition and correction, fellowship, but also to the lost, that they would know that there's a bread that will give them life beyond this life. Remember Jesus said, he said, life is more than food, the body more than clothing. Seek the kingdom first and all these things will be given to you. To do what? To bless and to glorify the Father. When we do everything we do as is in a way that our left hand doesn't know what our right hand is doing, but will at the same time glorify God as he himself will make it known to his glory. Have a great day. Stay warm.